Hello to our, our audience. On behalf of Aberdeen Performing Arts and the Festival Partners, welcome to Granite Noir. I'm Alex Clark and I'm delighted you've joined us for this event, part of the digital staging of Aberdeen's International Crime Writing Festival. I was just saying to the organisers what a shame it was not to be in Aberdeen as I was last year and had such a brilliant time. Um, but one of the advantages is that we can make connections across the world. And we are so thrilled to have the extraordinary Attica Lock with us. Hello, Attica, and welcome from Los Angeles. Yes, um, thank you guys for having me. And yes, I echo if there's been a, a silver lining in 2020, it's that we now know we can do this and, and we can be connected uh, even over great, great distances. Attica, we know that you have a, a fantastically busy schedule, so we're very grateful uh, to you for joining us. But on that note, uh, we are in fact recording this and also to do with our kind of vast time differences, we're recording this ahead of the festival. But the timing couldn't be more apposite, really. We are recording this interview on the day, the last day of the Trump presidency. And that is so apposite to, to your book, Heaven, My Home, and to Bluebird, Bluebird, of which it is the sequel and the book that we're going to focus on today, which really start as Trump rises to power. So yes. how is it feeling with you? Well, I have to say, maybe it's knowing you're where you are that this is an international forum. I just got quite emotional when you just described it being his last day. I actually feel really emotional. Yeah. This yeah. has been hell. This has been absolute hell. Um, and it feels so good to say, bye-bye, <laughs> please get out of here. I know there is, it has revealed, his rise to power has revealed such ugliness that was there the whole time. I've many times described his rise as like turning over a rock in the garden and there's like snakes that have been there the whole time. You just didn't look close enough. Um, but even I did not realize the breadth and depth to which there was this level of lasting violent white supremacy in the country. I knew there was systemic white supremacy. I knew it showed up in how we educate our children. It shows up in the economy, how people get jobs, how people are paid. It shows up in policing and law enforcement. But I did not realize the degree to which there was this rabid, dangerous white supremacy. And to, the, to, 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 to be honest, when I was writing Bluebird, Bluebird, Trump had not been elected when mm -hmm. I wrote that book. Mm -hmm. uh, he was certainly in debates and was rising among the Republican Party, but I didn't think he would ever get elected. But already you could see what was coming out. And I wrote about the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas in both books solely because it came out of my research. I was not trying to make a point necessarily. It's just that when I looked at, I didn't know what Texas Rangers did every day, if I'm being honest with you. When I came up with this idea to tell a story about a Texas Ranger, I was like, well, what do they do? I mean, they go to work and do what? And when I started doing deep research about them, and I found out that there had been this task force between the Rangers and the FBI and the Drug Enforcement Agency here in America, the people who regulate firearms, and they were going after the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. And they mm -hmm. were trying to take them down as a criminal organization. But it was so interesting to me that they looked at it through the lens of the like the mob. Like they were trying to get them on guns and drugs, not necessarily the killing or terrorizing the people of color. So when I was writing Blooper, Blooper, I remember having times like, oh, thinking, Attica, are you exaggerating this stuff? I mean, is it really like that bad? And then, yes, it is. And, and it turns out, yes, it is. And so that first book was written before it happened, before he was inaugurated. But you could feel where things were heading. And so there was this investigation of race and, and, and this kind of particular way of thinking. And kind of a, for me, with Bluebird, Bluebird, kind of a belief system that underneath a lot of this 
rage that we're seeing is a people who feel so dislocated, who are so psychically fragile. And I'm curious about what's underneath that, that for me as a writer, I want to know what's underneath, what is the, what is the wound? What is the psychic wound that's underneath that? I don't have to agree with it. I could think you're crazy, but I'm curious what is under that. And I think that for a lot of white folks in this country, not a lot, actually, let's stop saying that. It's really not that many. That's, we, we talked about this before we began. It's really not the majority of the country. It's not the majority of white people in this country. It is a small segment that is, has been given way too much power. I think there's a segment for them that feels so confused and let down by their government. And rather than look at the ways that capitalism is the reason why you're struggling, the ways in which the fact that we don't have national health care is the reason why you're struggling. Mm. The fact that we don't have a living wage nationally is the reason you're struggling. They looked outward and blamed other people of color, whom I frankly feel sometimes there's a sense of envy that people of color are ascending above them. Like, that's not right in America. The white man always kind of has to be on top. Anyway, there's a lot of words to say. That felt really good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last day of the Trump presidency. But I think I, I'm, I'm just taking from, from what you said then, that, that at the point at which you were writing Bluebird, Bluebird, and then Heaven My Home uh, takes place really just after Trump is inaugurated. And there's almost a sense of, okay, you know, we, we still need to keep doing what we're doing. We still need to try to dismantle this organization, the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. But you know, the world is, is different now and we're going to have to get on with that. And the fault lines are growing between characters who might have voted for Trump and isn't saying so, who obviously didn't. But at that point, when you started writing about this organization, do you feel that you, you thought that they really were these kind of absolute sort of outsiders, that they were almost sort of they were violent and they were angry, but there was no way that they were going to invade this mainstream of political thought. Yes, yes, uh, yes. I, I'm, I'm kind of, and also, and it, it has so many layers to it because there's not just the, the Aryan Brotherhood deep, you know, racist thought. There's also these wild, putative Christian conspiracy theories that people mm. are pedophiles, and it's all insane. And no, I never thought. I mean, the, the thing about, I think what, and again, going back to what I said before, what Trump has given this segment of the population is a feeling of agency that they have been missing in a country that in their minds, and in some ways is actually passing them by because of changes in uh, labor, how people make money. We don't do manufacturing here. So when you're talking... When you look when you look at the difference between the Ku Klux Klan and 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 the Aryan Brotherhood or this segment of white supremacists, the Klan and the White Citizens Council, its precursor, after they took off their hoods, they went to the bank where they were the bank president. They went to the city council. They you know were attorneys. They were wearing suits. They were upstanding middle class citizens. The Aryan Brotherhood and, and what we're seeing now are people who are so economically disenfranchised. Um, that they that that the classism plays into it in ways that they're not quite looking at. It's easier for them to look at America's original fault line, as you say, race, when really a lot of if they looked closely or were educated better, and I'm not saying they're stupid, I'm saying our education system is subpar. Mm -hmm. If they were educated better, they might have a way to look at it more in terms of Trump doesn't really care about their economic interests at all. He doesn't. And they can't. I don't know why there's an inability to see that he's playing them, that, that, that he doesn't care. But what he has done that they feel good about is that he has put voice to and shown a light on and legitimized. Yes, the white man has a boot on his neck. We've got to do something now. So the idea, of course, and we see it played out in right wing, far right movements throughout the, the, the world, is that. If I am disadvantaged, it must be because someone is taking my place. Someone is kicking me out. And I know when Bluebird, Bluebird was published, you felt that quite a lot of that was a reaction to the Obama presidency. There was a point where a certain sector of white voters 
wanted to make their feelings known about that, their discomfort yes. about that president. Yes. I have told a, and I, I don't know that this joke will play in, across the world, across the pond, so to speak, but shortly before Trump was elected, I told this observation slash joke many times, we had the Country Music Award here in uh, in the States. It's something, it's like the Grammys or, you know, like they have awards for Latin music, but the, the CMT, the Country Music Awards are a very big deal. And I was watching because over the course of my life, as I've gotten older, we can talk about this later, I've had grown a greater affection for country music. And on that broadcast, Beyonce stole the show by singing her song, Daddy Lessons, with the Dixie Chicks. And I've told the joke many times, that's when we lost. White people couldn't take it. They could not take it. Why is Beyonce on our show outshining us? And with the Dixie Chicks, those people can't stand the Dixie Chicks. And so I've made this joke so many times that that was just a sign of people feeling like the things that are ours, you guys are coming in and taking it. And of course, I'm being funny and I'm talking about in this very micro way about an award show. But visually, it was absolutely stunning to see Beyonce Knowles this black woman known deeply in R&B, married to this rapper, own, I mean, own the stage at, at, a, at an awards event that was predominantly, had always been white. And it was literally like weeks before Trump was elected. And what you say about people feeling like things are being taken from us, things that, that belong to us. So there's two parts that I wanna talk about. One is just, that is again, this feeling of, of, of white folks feeling like they had always been hierarchically at the top and now what is shifting what is happening if somebody like obama can ascend to the top of um, the top office in the land and to the degree that people of a certain ilk uh i think it's been said before that conservative thought tends to look at leaders in a patriarchal way and so to the degree that barack obama was a father figure i mean that made people's heads explode um, so that decentering of, of whiteness at the center of America is for a lot of people is a problem. But the other thing I want to talk about is about crime fiction and why I write crime fiction and, and this idea of scarcity and not enoughness. I am a believer that crime is about scarcity, that crime is about there's not enough land, there's not enough money. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's about there's not enough love when you see these domestic crimes or family crimes. There's not enough food. The, the illusion of scarcity, because there actually is enough. This is a quite plentiful, bountiful world that we live in. But the illusion that there's not enough makes people act out if they are unstable, if they have these violent impulses, it makes them act out. And I, as a crime writer, am fascinated by picking at and looking at that mentality of not enoughness and, and why it makes some people kind of go off the rails and do things that are that are gross, that are violent, that are that are wrong. Um, I'm, I'm curious about that, but I, I am a firm believer that a lot of violent impulses come out of this idea that somebody took something from me and it's there's just not enough when really there truly is. I mean, this is, is, is so interesting in, in Bluebird, Bluebird and Heaven, My Home, because they are very much novels of place. And that place is East Texas. Um, you were born in Houston and it's, it's where uh, Darren Matthews, your ranger, lives now. Although his, his heritage, his legacy, his past, his family past is, is, a, is along a highway, is out in the countryside. And of course, that land is contested there is a feeling of not enoughness as you say even though there are these i mean believe me from people who live in these tiny islands we can't comprehend how much space there is but it is to do with sort of wealth and agency and power just tell us a bit about your ranger about darren matthews and about his and um, about where we find him in this in this new book uh where we find him kind of in this land, having a sort of slightly difficult relationship with it. Yes, D Darren in some ways um, is a sketch of a contradiction within myself, uh, meaning I, I don't live in Texas anymore. 
but my love for it and my love for East Texas is boundless. Um, and I love it despite its flaws. I love it even when I feel like it doesn't love me back. It is the land that made me. And so I can't hate what made me. I just can't. Uh, I uh, was born and raised in Houston, but both of my parents are from tiny towns along East Texas. In fact, everybody on both sides are from like three counties going back to slavery. So I've spent many years looking at the fact that my family is the opposite of the story of the Great Migration, for which if readers want to know more about this historical event and in the States, there's a book called The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson, which tells the story of basically, I think it was the greatest intra-migration that's ever happened in a nation. Millions of people of Black folks moving from the South to the North. Well, my family stayed. And I, a lot of this book is investigating why. Uh, a lot of you know this series is investigating why, as it's investigating Darren's complicated love for a place that breaks his heart. And, and the reason why he picked up the badge uh, is because he thought that if I wear this badge, perhaps I can make this a place that's safe for everybody, that belongs to everybody and belongs to Black folks who helped build it. And of course, you know, I always said I would never write a cop. I was adamant that I would never write a police officer. I just thought, I don't know, what do I know about police? And I don't see the world through an establishment lens. Um, but when I came up with this idea that he had been raised by these two twin, identical twin uncles who looked exactly the same, but could not be more different in terms of ideological thought and spirit, it, it, it's how I found Darren. And I actually grew up with twin great uncles who looked exactly alike and were different. I mean, not nearly as different as the uncles in my books, but I grew up with um, my great uncles and one was a colonel in the army and one was a uh, professor. And they were just different. And I thought, oh, let's look at that. And so Darren being raised by one man who had been a ranger himself, who believed that law could protect black folks, uh, that if we wore the badge too, that would be some insurance against uh, you know, mistreatment and, and that sort of thing. And then his other, this guy's identical twin brother was a criminal defense attorney. He said, no, the law for black folks in America is a lie. It is a thing that we need protection from. And that Darren sits between these two poles is kind of me in the sense that I am somebody who always, who has wrongly or rightly impulses towards patriotism, impulses toward wanting to love where I'm from. Mm -hmm. while also feeling rage about it as well. And it makes me think of, it makes me think of the play, The Diary of Anne Frank. And I know I'm gonna say something that has been contested that her father supposedly said, but some people think he did never actually say, but in the play, you know, there's the famous line of Anne Frank saying, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are good at heart. Mm -hmm. And the father in the play saying, she puts me to shame. And there is debate about whether or not he actually said that, but those poles, I live there. I live between those poles. I live between the impulse towards optimism, the impulse towards um, brotherhood, the impulse toward um, connectedness for all of us. And the other side of me is like, no, fuck that. Nah, uh-uh, I don't know, I'm scared. Mm. So. I found Darren in that poll in wanting to stand up and protect and serve and also feeling like he's doing all kinds of stuff behind the scenes to fix stuff that isn't right and getting himself deeper and deeper into trouble. And so East Texas is in my blood for sure, but I think it also can be a stand in for, for what I think many black Americans, black Americans feel about being an American, like I both want to love it, I, I want to serve it, but it doesn't always serve me back or love me back, so then what? How does that work in terms of the kind of deep structures of American life that you begin to take apart in terms of how they kind of manifest themselves and express themselves sort of on the more superficial level, on the level that we all live at every day? But as a Black American writer, thinking about those deep structures of patriarchy, Christianity, domination, 
they are stuff that is so intractable, aren't they? So hard to think of how you find your place. And I mean, I think I suppose what I'm I'm kind of saying is that in the books, Aaron Matthews, one of the things you feel about him is he's trying hard to find a place where he can simply be and do his job. And that seems to go so far back that you think, well, how can he? Will he ever? Again, that's a very good question for somebody who has to write another book and I don't have the answer to where he's going to find himself. But, but I do, I think he has a line in, I don't know why I always start with saying, I think, I wrote the book. I don't know why I'm saying, I think there's a line. There you is should a line. know. <laughs> Although a line I, suppose, I suppose people, when people read it, they read it more recently than you, you wrote it. I that guess. is correct. That is correct. That is correct. But in talking about his uncle, Darren makes the observation that his uncle can have all of these high-minded ideas about what the law can and can't do in academia and in the, in the ivory towers, and that he is boots on the ground living the question. And you know that that to me sums up Darren best that he's li all constantly living the question of, of whether or not things can be bridged, whether or not he can. Um, find his way through all these uh, structures and systems that you're talking about and whether or not what I do love about him is that even in his he has a drinking problem and he can be morose he uh, there's still a little kernel of hope in there there's mm. such a kernel of like duty and humanity to him and I think you really see it in heaven, my home with this with this missing child, and yes. I can tell you where that came from. And what's so funny about being a writer is that you can finish a book, not consciously knowing where something came from, and only later realizing it. Well, that little boy, where that came from for me is that I live in LA. Uh, four years ago, almost exactly now, because the inauguration was four years ago. My daughter was uh, 10. She was in, uh, I believe, the fifth grade. And the day of the inauguration, I remember we had to, there was a school event that day and I was weeping. And I remember turning around to look at one mother uh, of a black child and we both looked at each other and she reached for my hand and we both started crying. I was just out of sorts the whole day. And there was another family there. There was a family of a little boy, also 10, who had called another is white child had called the black child at school the n-word this is in southern california this is in 2017 my daughter went to at that time the most leftist hippie dippy progressive school you could imagine and yet there a white child had looked at a black child and called that person the n-word yeah. i lost it i was like excuse my language fuck that kid Fuck that kid's parents. Don't come anywhere near me. And in fact, when I saw them at the inauguration, the mix of those things just set me off. It just really set me off. And I was so upset. My family had many, many, many dinner conversations about this event because my daughter was willing to forgive. She said for years this went on. We talked about this off and on for years. She said, I don't, something's wrong in his house. I don't understand where that came from. I feel sorry for him. Over time, she started giving me hints that he thinks you really don't like him. He's really sorry about what happened. And then I had to look at myself as a grown woman and ask, wait a second, Attica, you can't forgive a kid? Whoa. And when I really slowed down to begin to think about it, I realized that we're, that reaction was coming from when I was 10. It shows you how the... Mm, mm, how this deep trauma happens, I had been actually shot with a BB gun and called the N-word by another 10-year-old boy. So somewhere in my psyche, my, you know, we were talking about what are the wounds underneath everything. For me, I PTSD-wise literally went back to when I was 10 and a boy did this to me and called me the N-word. And I was dumping all of this onto this child in 2017 who felt remorse, who so... That's where Levi came from. And I didn't even realize it when I was writing it. This question of can Levi be saved? Where is he? Can he be saved becomes metaphor for can you stop the 
perpetuation of racist thought and racist acts. Can that boy in my daughter's school be stopped? Or, and also the, the, the children of white supremacists, can, is this generational, it will never stop, or can you stop it? And I think me having to find within myself a tenderness for this child, which I did eventually, I told my daughter uh, that I forgive him. And I invited him to our home for her birthday party. But but it was it was you know it was work for me to do. And again, I oh, but I still echo what, what Dina says. Why are we always the ones having to do that kind of work where we're looking for the humanity in people, and yeah. it doesn't always get mirrored back at us? I mean, it's really there is a kind you know there's a, a really masterful opening chapter to Heaven My Home that we basically see this child who's nine years old on the cusp of disappearance. We see what happens to him, although we don't, we don't know what, what has happened to him. And you're inside his head and you're so anxious with him that he's not gonna find his way home. And he is a character who you already do feel a kind of tenderness for because his mum's a mess up, his dad's not there, we discover why. Uh, he's got a kind of really grim sort of mother's boyfriend. It, it, his life is not great. And the minute then when Darren has to kind of face the fact that he this boy is connected to the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas by family and has to say, look, it's his duty to find him. It is the right thing to do to find him. And yet it's quite hard to care that much about him. That's a very big moment in the book, isn't it? Because it's kind of splitting that idea that you know, duty is something you must always feel, you must always be magnanimous, you must always rise above. And the question I guess you're asking is, well, must you and why and to what effect? Very much so. A lot of this book for me was about forgiveness, which is about, and I, I, it's about what happens tomorrow. I've been saying for years, Trump will be gone. He will be either out of office, he will drop dead, he'll be impeached, he'll be gone. How do we as fellow citizens how do we interact with each other on the other side of that? I don't know. I mean, do I forgive everybody who put him in office? Is it da is forgiveness dangerous because it gives people the feeling that they can do it again? Um, can you even have forgiveness if the if the original injury is still occurring? How can I forgive a Trump supporter if they're still saying it was fine that they went and stormed the Capitol? We had to do that. The election was stolen. Well, I don't know how to live with you guys, and but we have to. I, I don't, you know, it's not safe for us to not figure out a way to live together. But I don't know how to. I don't know how to meet Trump supporters where they are. I don't know. And actually, frankly, it's dangerous for me to. Uh, it's funny. I was on another um, panel like this with a speaker who. Uh, it was a. a I believe he's British, uh, a white man who was like, we've got to understand and we've got to ask it. You, you can't just marginalize it. And I was very much like, well, you can do that. It is not mm. safe for me to go knock on their door and go, hey, what are y'all thinking? No, 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 I'm not doing that. Um, it's just, I don't know where we go from here. I feel both a sense of exhilaration and relief about the fact that tomorrow is the inauguration of a new president. But I also literally don't know if I'm gonna wake up tomorrow and a bomb has gone off, or I don't know what happens in the future that I, I don't know. And I, I, I don't, I'm frankly flummoxed. I don't know how to understand this, this rabid idea that the election was stolen. I don't, I don't, I don't know. And I, I mean, we, we spoke a little bit earlier before we started recording and I was talking about listening to this podcast that interviewed Trump supporters uh, after the insurrection. And th this woman was like, there's just so much out there that's not being heard. And, and they shut down parlor and they shut down this. And, and, and the, the reporter was like, wait, that's where you were getting your information? Yeah. <laughs> you, almost yeah. could hear, you could almost see the look on her face in a podcast of like, wait, what lady? You're getting your information from parlor? I, I, I if you don't trust the New York Times, you don't trust the Guardian, you don't trust the Independent. I don't, what what are we doing now? It's it's really interesting to to hear you discuss that in the context of crime fiction, which has always been something. I mean, you alluded it to earlier to it earlier. You're interested about the mechanics and the whys and wherefores of writing about crime fic, of writing crime fiction far more than you're interested in writing a police procedural, a police guy. I mean, you 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 know, the lawyer 
uh, who who kind of led your first two books and and now it's strange yes is is a police officer of sorts but it's a different kind of relationship to authority um as well um you've said in the past i think you know i get away with a lot because there's a dead body on the floor <laughs> I, 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 I paraphrase slightly but it was something along those lines um you're basically talking about how you address things and that might be things like conspiracy and disinformation and lying frankly because you will make use of the tropes of crime fiction. Yes, and, and I am both making use of them in a, in a conscious, pointed way, but also this is actually just my taste. I'm interested in mysteries. I'm interested in why people do the things they do, why they think they're going to get away with it. I'm interested in how somebody takes a set of disparate facts and, and as a detective mind, whether you're literally a detective or you're just a character that's been unfortunately tasked with figuring something out, how you figure stuff out. I find all of that fascinating. So it, there's no cynicism in why I've chosen crime to get away with something, even though I do think I'm getting away with something. It's just, I like it. I'm just, I'm, I'm fascinated, but I'm curious about it. Um, but I, I think that crime fiction has a way of taking the ethereal and the theoretical and the, all this, and it puts it on the ground. It makes it really real. I also think that because I'm married to an attorney, my husband is what we call in America a public defender, meaning he um, is the person that if you are indigent, if you have no money, the government has to provide you with a with a solicitor, with a lawyer. And and my husband is one of these lawyers, and he uh, Los Angeles has the largest and probably arguably the best public defender system in the country in America. Uh, it was actually started by a woman. And um, I love this because we named our daughter after her. Uh, the woman's name was Clara Shortridge Fultz, and our daughter's name is Clara. And we chose that because this woman couldn't get any clients as a, as a woman. So she said, I will represent people who can't afford a lawyer and ended up inventing this system in America. And because I see through my husband's work how laws that get created in, in Washington, D.C., are laws that get created in Sacramento, which is a state capital here in California, what that actually looks like when someone gets arrested and why they get arrested and when they get arrested. It may, it, I, I live in a house in which everything trickles down into a very concrete, uh, high stakes situation that my husband then sees one side of it as an attorney. And I think that has greatly informed the ways in which I think that crime fiction can explore big socio-political themes and sociological themes while staying deeply grounded, you know, I want to say, I don't mean literally, but deeply grounded in plot and, and just, it, it makes it understand, it makes it bite-sized and understandable in a way. Can I ask you how it has felt, feels um, to be a crime writer? basically in a tradition that has been pretty white. I mean, most of the kind of detectives who are in our mind, I mean, certainly we look at the golden age of detectives, but even in more recent years, are, are white saviors of a, of a certain kind. They are working in a largely white framework. Um, and obviously there have been writers of color who have written extraordinarily popular and acclaimed detective uh, fiction, like Walter Mosley, for example. Yeah. It, but it has, it has been a very white area. And I wonder how it has felt to kind of enter that arena and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do with my bit of ground here. Well, I have to say, I think Walter Mosley is such a template for, I don't know that I would, I would have the career I have without him, without his. Um, but I would say that, that with my first book, which was pretty well, received there were a couple of people who just did not get it they and it what i don't know that it was so much because of nah it was i was gonna try and give people the benefit of the doubt fuck it i was gonna say <laughs> i don't think this was because of race but it is in a way it is it is and it isn't meaning what what turned off some i got some bad reviews i got i've gotten you know what people have had to say is what is all this history in here 
What I, what is all this history? I, that, why I don't want to. What is all that? It's not. It didn't read as important to them. Also, there were people who did not understand Jay Porter, my first protagonist, mm-hmm. because he is reticent. He is um, reactionary, and 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 there are plenty of people who are like he's a he's a um, what is the word they always use. He's a reactive character. He's not progressive. He's not active. He's not going out and doing things. Here's the thing. I'm paraphrasing. I think I heard this quote from Ava DuVernay, who I think got it from somebody else, that protagonism is privilege. Mm -hmm. So that for Jay Porter, what it feels like to be Black in America and a Black man in America, you are reacting to a lot of shit. You don't feel like you have a lot of agency. So... This is something I come up against a lot in my uh, writing because it comes up for me a ton. And as I have switched over to TV, my default setting is I write reactive characters. Mm -hmm. And that is anathema to television. It's anathema to a lot of people who think you have to approach all storytelling with your protagonist being active and having a goal and going out to get the goal and being thwarted to getting around that. Whereas actually, I feel like being alive is a lot of this. It's a lot of just ducking stuff. Mm-hmm. So there were ways in which people did not get him. They did not understand him. He just looked on his face if you compared him with another uh, protagonist in a crime book as somebody who wasn't doing anything. Why doesn't he just go to the police? Uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I noticed a lot of that. I noticed a little of it with Pleasant, though, more in, more in an internal way in which the plot turned on something that and by intro, I meant there were a little bit of struggles with, with, with my editor. I, I feel funny even saying this out loud. But anyway, there were some arguments about whether or not the plot could turn on the destruction of voting rights, uh, of, of voting power for black folks. And literally, the whole plot turns on that. Mm-hmm. And to me, I can't think of anything but higher stakes. I mean, what? But, but my editor was like, no, that, that, that's not that. It's just not that interesting or not that the stakes aren't high enough. And I just had to really stand my ground and say, so I think where I've run into it has not been like people's unwillingness to accept a black character on its face. That's not what anybody consciously is thinking, but they're being challenged to sit inside characters that they've never sat inside before, who have different motivations, who have different ways of, of dealing with conflict, who do not feel like they have the same amount of agency that you as a white reader might feel they should have. This mm. is what it really feels like, at least from this writer's point of view, to live inside a Black body in America. I, I mean, obviously, we're, we're talking about it in terms of fiction over the course of the last four years. Um, We've seen something that has been happening forever take a really center stage in terms of police brutality, in terms of the protest against that. And I wondered how, again, this battle between optimism and realism, this feeling of why should we have to be doing this for people to be treated fairly, how that has felt to you, obviously, personally, but also how it kind of feeds into the idea of talking about justice and crime and retribution as you write? Well, I will say this about after the events of the summer, uh, the the explosion of awareness uh, after the death of George Floyd, I I thought about the fact that I'm writing this police character, this Black officer. What, What do I do with that? I do think Darren already understands that he has too much power as a cop. I think it's very clear in heaven, my home, that he knows this is way too easy. It is way too easy for me to falsify documents, plant evidence, frame somebody for something. I kind of have too much power. You can feel him wrestling with it, but also thinking, but they've been doing this for years, so I should be able to do it too, and and all that kind of stuff. So I think that for Darren, and I don't think there are that many more books to come. One, I think they are simply of the Trump era. Uh, Three, I don't want to write him forever. And I feel like I probably will will wrap him up in another book or so. So I think that's to be explored where he ultimately lands. Uh, I'm kind of curious and and finding it within myself. For me personally, this summer was um, 
I made the joke to my husband who um, is super white. I mean, he's, he's from Missouri, born in Chicago, but his dad is a German immigrant and his mother is Greek. And I made the joke of what's the German word for gratitude mixed with rage? Mm-hmm. Because that's what I felt all summer. Mm-hmm. I felt, thank God, but also what the, where the fuck have y'all been? Huh? Mm-hmm. And I felt, I don't have a word. I don't have the word for the rage I felt that so many people were calling me. Hey, Attica, how are you feeling? Are you okay? I'm just checking. You didn't check in with me when 800 other people got lynched. Mm-hmm. Why now? And I have my belief system that the why now of it is about COVID. I think that the fact that society in and of itself was breaking down, that COVID in America revealed, whoa, we do not have our stuff together as a nation at all. And we do not take care of our citizens. We are not in control of this. And I think it revealed such, um, people felt so ignored not paid attention to, not well taken care. People were starving. We were arguing about could people get a relief check. I mean, it is not like anywhere else in the world where citizens were were much more well taken care of. So people are unemployed. They're broke. They're seeing they can't get a shot or a test anywhere. And then you see this man get killed by the government. And I think that was fueling a lot of it. And then, frankly, a lot of it became performative. Then a lot of it became performative. And it was really white people signaling to each other that I'm not the other kind of white. Mm-hmm. And that's infuriating. And, but yet, and yet, it still can make change. So it's this weird thing of like being grateful for the noise. We are talking about nakedly about racism in America in a way that I've never seen in my lifetime. Like nakedly on the news, no more, oh, that seems racially tinged. Just no, uh-uh, mm-hmm. that shit is racist. And you're hearing more firm, frank language which we have to have because you cannot solve what you won't name. So I'm grateful for what happened this summer. But I remember saying to a lot of people like, oh, no, no, no. I had so many people tell me, all white people, no, this time just feels different. I'm like, "Mm, Mm. to you maybe, it doesn't feel different to me and time will tell. I do think the best thing that's happened out of all of the protests through the summer, yes, is the awareness of, the profound mistreatment uh, and 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 the, the the profound difference in the way that white bodies and black bodies are treated in this country. When I watch one of the, oh, I'm, I feel emotion about it. One of the most painful things about the insurrection was watching it. When you compare it to so many black folks being killed in their own homes, mm-hmm. done nothing being killed on the street, done nothing. Uh, Being killed for playing with a toy, done nothing. Been killed for playing loud music, done nothing. And these people stormed a Capitol building. And what I saw, I actually did not like Joe Biden saying when he gave his speech afterwards, this is not who we are. It is who we are, it is America. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is, that happened last, was it last Wednesday? Jesus mm. Christ. So I can't even keep time anymore. January 6th, what, ha- what I saw that day is that every piece of American life and American history told those people that they had the right and that they could do it and, and live. And I do not walk around with that privilege. They, for that very, very first part of it, were referred to fairly consistently as protesters rather than as terrorists. And I know that, that that in Heaven My Home, there's actually an issue when people start talking about a terrorist organization, which the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas is. Do you think there is now a widespread acceptance that those people, not obviously by people who sympathize with them and feel that the election was stolen from them, but from everyone else, that these are domestic terrorists? I think there's enough of there's enough of that way of talking and chatter and uh, in the media and the zeitgeist that gives me hope and a sense of okay I recognize I got, I, I see some humanity here I wish it were more I but it it may simply be that we're still in the terms of how things are being covered in America I think we're still giving too much attention to fringe 
craziness. Um, so it looks like it's more even than it actually is. You know, people keep saying half the country feels like it's not half. It really numerically it simply is not half. Um, but but there are people who are disgusted by what happened who I think and over time when more information is able to come out, I think there's a lot that's that's on lockdown because the inauguration is tomorrow. Meaning I think people were more face to face with I mean, lawmakers were more face to face with their own potential death than we actually realize. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Ortez has alluded to it and alluded to their reasons security-wise why she can't talk about where they were hidden and all this kind of stuff. But I actually think this could have been an absolute massacre. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I realize um, Attica, I am throwing all these enormous questions at you. <laughs> And they are huge because, of course, we, you know, again, on the other side of the Atlantic, looked at that unfolding with horror and incomprehension, but also the knowledge that it is a foolishness to say that could never happen here, because history is littered with people saying that could never happen here. I wonder, and before we just we will go right back to the books, I promise, um, but I wanted to ask you really about this idea of healing you know, it's a, it's a word that is used in politics now. Biden is seen as this candidate who can heal America. Um, a woman of color is the vice president for the first time. But it's very much just said than done. I don't, it, I don't know what people mean by that. I'm a little suspicious about what people mean by it. My healing is not sitting down and having some iced tea with a Trump supporter. I'm not, I'm not going to heal by trying to understand your dangerously racist way of thinking. I, what is that? So I don't, that, that's the opposite of healing for me. So I, I don't know. My way forward would be less to worry about healing because I'm, I'm telling you, you're not going to pull over. You're, there's a, this fringe element. You're not going to get them ever. I say you move forward with the people who are thinking clearly and straight. And I think good governance will make people come around. I think when they come in and uh, Biden uh, does this one point whatever trillion dollar uh, stimulus package, when, when people get the, the money that they need to stay at home safely, when they feel cared for and they see good governance, the hope was that that's the way you just lead for it. And I would just suck the oxygen out of the out of this French element. I don't know how to heal with them because they still believe that they're right. And they mm -hmm. don't understand their, they believe they're right about the election. They have not done any kind of deep investing. I mean, at least, you know, in South Africa, the truth and reconciliation, the Nuremberg trial, people had to sit and think about the shit that they fucking did. Mm -hmm. I don't see anybody sitting and thinking like, oh, what led up to all this? Like mm -hmm. nobody doing, that's not true to say nobody. There are plenty of people in this country who are doing deep thinking about how can I be different? What can I read to shift my way of thinking? How can I check my privilege? That is happening at a great level since this summer. Then those are the people I can heal with. I can't heal with this French group. I, I, I'm not interested in healing with them. I don't, I don't need to, we don't need to be at a barbecue together. You don't sit at my lunch table. We're not friends and that's okay. I can't, I'm not going to heal at my own expense. I'm not going to make you feel better about us coming together at my own, at the expense of my health and safety. I'm not going to do it. On the other hand, Attica, and I completely understand that, I would quite like to see some of those people have to talk to you at a barbecue. <laughs> because I think you could, they wouldn't, I don't think they'd go, go very far in, in trying to argue their case, I have to say. Uh, you have a, a, such a kind of, forensic and and straightforward way of talking about the realities uh, that are facing people of all kinds, uh, including those, those deluded Trump supporters, bringing that to bear in fiction, as opposed to bringing it to bear in the screenwriting that you also do, because of course you've, you've most recently um, been a writer on Little Fires Everywhere, Celeste Ings, the adaptation of Celeste Ings' novel, um, When They See Us, you've written, of course, on Empire. I mean, this, this business of finding these different ways into, into which, in, in ways to tell stories, in which to tell stories, 
this way of finding these different ways in which to tell stories. Um, you alluded to the fact that, you know, Darren Matthews, maybe not forever. What is coming next? Where are we going next in, in the Attica lot world? Well, there is a Darren book coming. That is coming. That is that is in in the in the midst. Um, but the very first thing up is that I um, was am executive producing a television show that's based on my sister's memoir. My sister's a memoir. She wrote a book, uh, and it's about her. Um, she studied abroad in Italy and Florence and fell in love with a Sicilian chef. And they ended up making a life together in the States. And it's about his family's uh, putative disapproval, although really it was about a deep, deeper family rift. My family trying to figure out all this kind of stuff. And I've described it as it's as if <laughs> it's as if it's Romeo and Juliet, but the Capulets are from East Texas and the Montagues are Sicilians. And it's just <laughs> It, it has humor and and pathos and and it's a Netflix series and we're we're in pre-production right now so I am watching casting tapes and revising scripts and doing all those things so that that's like right in front of me right here. And tell us just and obviously that won't be coming to our screens really soon but tell us what it's called so we can look out it's, for it. Oh, one hundred percent. The book is called From Scratch. And that will be the title of the, the series from scratch. I think the full title is from scratch. Um, I think it's love and finding home in Sicily because the story's my, my, my sister's love, her husband, he unfortunately passed away in 2012. And so the story actually has two love stories. It's, it's when they met and they had this passionate kind of erotic eros kind of love. And when, by the time you get to the end of the series and he's gone, my sister and her mother-in-law have this different kind of maternal agape love that's bigger than language and, and borders and country. And there's something in that that is really, I think, fundamentally who I am, which is that I want to believe, and I do believe fundamentally that we are brothers and sisters. We are all connected beyond language, beyond... Um, but but part of being in that brotherhood means I accept your right to exist. So we can't be brothers and sisters if you somehow, I can't exist in your world. Uh, that that I'm not into. But for everyone else, we don't have to pray the same way. We don't have to believe the same things. We don't have to like the same food. We don't have to speak the same language. And there can still be a depth of love that is what it is to be alive as a human being. Some of that has been tested, I mean, quite apart from all the political um, contortions, convulsions that we've been talking about. Uh, over the last year by the pandemic, obviously, and by the fact that we have been really in our little selves with these fantastic moments when we can reach out and connect with people that, you know, it's really unlikely that we would meet, you know, walking down the street, Los Angeles to Aberdeen to rural Kilkenny, which is where I am, you know, <laughs> we're not going to end up in a bar, it's sad but true, not yet. Um, but it has been a really difficult time for us to keep our own kind of heads together, hasn't it? What's it been like for you creatively speaking? Um, okay, and I think because, because I've been in, in this television world, so it, it's a gift and a curse, meaning in some ways it's a gift because I just have stuff to do. I just got to get this stuff going. And in fact, I... Um, when the insurrection happened, I had therapy the next day. And I was like, well, I, I, I've got to just put all this rage I feel in a box because I can't get any work done. And I thought my therapist would be like, well, let's know, Attica, we really need to unpack all these feelings. Instead, she was like, OK, let's describe the box. <laughs> like, yeah, let's put it in a box. You're right. So having all of this work where I'm having to respond to emails and do this and, and move at a quick pace means I'm up and functioning. What I think I've missed is that I have not been, though I have worked on my book during the pandemic, not as much as I maybe would like, because that's the kind of work that allows for deep, deep thinking. It's deep contemplative, existential. What are we all doing here? What do I believe? What matters to me in this world? And I think that kind of thinking and that kind of work would have been a much more of a balm through this time period because I'd be trying to make sense of it. Yeah. But also... It could have been, because I'm just saying this as theory, it could have been that that was overwhelming and I just would have laid down and taken a nap every day. 
I don't know. <laughs> naps, naps, as we know, are, are, are good, though, and they are the fantastic part of being a writer and not having to go to the office every day. You can have a nap. But that there is this other thing about the difference between screenwriting and, and novel writing. You know, the, the writer David Nichols, you know, who, who does both, uh, says, well, it's kind of terrifying when you're writing a screenplay because, you know, if you put kind of, you know, there's a snowstorm or something, it's going to cost God knows how many thousands of dollars. You can do what you like in a book. It's all ink on the page. If you want to have explosions and car chases and hurricanes, you can. That kind of <laughs> sense of freedom, is that something that you prize about, about that just imaginative freedom? That is literally why I decided to write books, because I have been in Hollywood for years before I wrote my first novel. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really getting where I wanted to get. I was making money, but nothing was getting made. And of course, all of these, it just felt heavy. And books felt possible, inexpensive. And you're right, just absolute, total and complete freedom. And I think taking time off, I borrowed money on my house to write my first book. It was the greatest gift I ever gave to myself because it helped me slow down, find my voice, and um, really get clear about what I wanted to say in the world. Well, you found the voice and you've really said a lot and you've said a lot here today and I thank you so much uh, for it, Attica. And I don't, I don't take for granted the fact that when you are as a writer and as a thinker, and as a black woman asked to come up with these responses to these really difficult questions, it, it leaves an impression. It's work. I mean, it's a lot of kind of heavy duty emotional work to talk about these things over and over again. And may I say thank you for that? Not many people say that. And you're right. And I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, it's, it's been a huge pleasure and privilege to talk to you. Now, we know there's one more da Darren Matthews. I'm not going to ask you to say what's after that novel wise, but just <laughs> give us a little hint. Do you have a kind of idea of a universe that you might be wanting to move on to? Several, in fact, several. I mean, I, I there's some more East Texas stories I wanna tell during different time periods uh, in history. And maybe there's always in the back of my head, maybe a California book. I'm terrified, terrified, but, I wouldn't mind trying that. Well, I think we'll follow you wherever wherever you go to. Um, please keep writing. Uh, please get through tomorrow in the best way that you can. We hope it's going to be a day of joy for the world. Uh, and, and we can only hope that things will, will get better. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us here at Granite Noir. Um, just to say to our audience, I really hope that you've enjoyed that as much as I certainly have. Um, the Granite Noir book selling partner is Waterstone, so please do use their website to purchase all Attica's books, all of them, I'd say. Read them beginning to, to end. Um, or any of the other Granite Noir writers, go to waterstones.com and there are links at the, the festival site. Uh, I do hope you can come to more events. I'm going to be chairing a few and there is an amazing program. But in the meantime, huge, huge thanks, Attica. Huge thanks to you for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it.